classmates in live classes. Students also gain more time to engage in other activities. At Genuine Digital School, we believe in the potential and talent of our students to implement their ideas to change the world and make a difference. If you dream it, you can create it. We are different. We are authentic. We are genuine digital school. Leave your legacy to the world. Every human being is born unique and develops in its own special way. Every one of us has a different point of view. A way of understanding and learning. A genuine way that we call our own. The world is moving fast, times are changing, and at Genuine, we know this very well. The new generations are called to improve the world through actions that generate change. Our mission is to educate, empower, and connect our students through remote learning experiences that transcend geographical and language boundaries. We envision a world in which children and teenagers use their skills and passions to undertake innovative collaborative projects that positively impact society. We want to inspire them to transform the world through technology, innovation and entrepreneurship. We create enriching learning experiences for our students in a modern digital environment that also provides more flexibility to our students' daily routine and location. We believe in their ideas, their dreams, and encourage their intellectual and professional development. And through the use of technological we tools, are often we help them find Instagram solutions to the We are problems. genuine digital. We awaken their curiosity, their desire to investigate and grow in knowledge so that they can obtain a U.S. high school diploma. This is the place where your children can create, develop, experiment, learn and discover what makes them genuine and unique. We are committed to a globalized, multicultural world with access to bilingual education from anywhere in the world. Veinte segundos de la transmisión. Listo, profesora. Gracias. Okay. So, well, buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. Dear students, parents, guardians, and members of our Genuine Digital School community, we are delighted to welcome you to our special event, The Hunting for Black Holes Beating Life. As you know, these are the spaces where we invite inspiring people so they can share their experiences with all of us. 
Today, we are going to have the privilege for hosting a renowned expert in the physics field and her dedication and work, as well as her passion for unraveling the secrets of the universe and well, black holes. So our guest speaker is Dr. Maria Montserrat Juarez Audrey, and she will guide us in a very interesting journey across the back captivating realm of black holes. So ladies and gentlemen, and all of our curious minds, allow me to introduce our guest speaker. She is originally from the port of Veracruz, from Mexico. She holds a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of the Americas Puebla. She has also earned her master's and doctorate degrees in science at the Center of Research and Advanced Studies for the National Polytechnic Institute, and she has specialized in leaf sheets black holes. Very interesting. And well, Dr. Juarez is at the forefront of research in black holes existence and thermodynamics. She focuses on high order theories with the framework of the norm in gravity correspondence. I know that this is really complex, guys, but it's going to be really, really interesting. And well, her work has even have been has even been published in esteemed journals such as Physical Review in Classical and Quantum Gravity. And well, she has even as well given seminars through all over Europe, North and South America. Currently, Dr. Juarez is a member of the Black Holes and Gravitational Waves Network, and she's also a distinguished scholar in the National System of Researchers here in Mexico. And she is actually serving as the Director of Sciences and Mathematics at Arkansas State University, Campus Querétaro. And well, I also want to mention that she was recently recognized as one of the inspiring women in here in the state of Querétaro, where I also live. And well, I want to welcome this inspiring woman, Dr. Maria Montserrat Juarez Aubrey, to our conference today. And well, guys, please use your reaction so we can welcome our guest today. Thank you very much. So I also, before we start, guys, I want to mention that we are going to have the chance to uh, well, make any questions to Dr. Juarez at the end of the meeting. So I encourage all of you to be curious, to be to stay engaged, and do not hesitate at the end to ask any questions to our guest speaker. Now, Dr. Juarez, the floor is yours, and you can begin and share your experience with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jazz. And um, so I wanted to start with this image. I don't know if you guys can see it. Uh, so the little person over there is me, the one with the shirt that has the birds over there. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to share a picture of me when I was younger is not only so that you can have a little laugh, uh, but also because I wanted to show you how old I was when I first heard about black holes. Um, so I was about the age of many of you when I heard about them for the first time. I actually read about them in a book, in a Spanish book, in a reading book. Um, and honestly, I was super scared uh, because I thought, well, these are like gigantic vacuum cleaners that can pretty much suck everything up and, uh, you know, what they might eat the earth or whatever. Uh, and why is nobody panicking? So I was I was somewhat terrified about them. Um, and that terror, I think, sparked some sort of curiosity. Uh, and I wanted to know a little bit more about them to see if we were like or like in danger of being, you know, completely destroyed by <laughs> some kind of monster in the universe. And mind you, this was all before the Internet. So I had to yeah. find some um, books, try to figure it out. That there were only some drawings about how artists sort of really imagined that black holes in the world. look like. Um, but that kind of did spark my curiosity with, with science and kind of left me in, in this path of, of becoming a physicist later in life, right? And this was really my first experience with black holes. Uh, now, of course, you're not as old as I am. You were probably not born in the 80s. So maybe your first experience with a black hole was different, right? Maybe the first time that you saw a black hole could have looked a little bit more like this. 
no? In one of these beautiful pictures called Treasure Planet, right? Or maybe for some of you, it was a little bit more like this. Uh, this is a Thor Dark World, I will say not my favorite Marvel movie and not my favorite Thor movie, but it does have a black hole grenade and that gives it a lot of points. So maybe some of you heard about the concept of a black hole for the first time in that one. Uh, or maybe for some of you, it was this great movie called Interstellar that came out uh, a decade ago almost now. Uh, and it was pretty impressive. And one of the things that you can see is that this, uh, they have this black hole called Gargantua that was actually pretty cool because instead of just imagining how it would look like, uh, the scientists collaborated with the people from special effects and they actually put the mathematical and physical equations to actually see how the black hole was supposed to look like. So that was, that was amazing. If this was your first black hole, I, I, I'm jealous of you. <laughs> um, it's it's completely amazing. Or, you know, perhaps uh, it was the black hole of Fortnite. Um, you know, this this um, this video game now that uh, at one point it did have a black hole. Um, so whatever your first experience with a black hole was, let me talk to you about why I'm here today. What is the main goal uh, of having this conversation today, this morning? Uh, and the main idea of this talk is that I want to show you that throughout time, mankind has been very, very curious about black holes to the point of kind of behaving like paparazzis of black holes. <laughs> we have become somewhat black hole detectives. We want to know all about them and we kind of spy on them. This is why I called um, this talk hunting for black holes um, because this is, this is practically how I see myself <laughs> and many fellow scientists. We're just really people uh, that want to know as much as possible about them. And so we're kind of uh, black hole detectives. So, Rule number one of detectives is really studying your target first, right? If we're trying to be detectives, then we need to understand who we're looking at, right? Uh, so rule number one, trying to understand what a black hole is, right? So let me very briefly try to explain what's a black hole, okay? A black hole, we don't really see it so much as an object. We see it more like a region, okay? Like a region in space-time. Okay, in space and time, where the gravitational field is very, very intense. Okay, you've ever heard about gravity? What is gravity? Gravity is something that pulls you, right? Pulls you somewhere. No, for example, objects that have mass attract each other. No, this lipstick and I are getting attracted to each other because we have mass. No, that's a gravitational pull. No, my phone and the cup are being attracted to each other gravitationally. We don't see the effects very much because they're not very heavy objects, but the heavier the object, the more we feel the gravitational effects. That's why we really do feel the gravitational pull of the Earth, right? In that way, we don't fly, <laughs> okay? Uh, we also, if we were in Jupiter, we would feel like a tremendous pull from Jupiter because Jupiter is heavier than the Earth, it has a bigger mass, right? Well, black holes are regions in which these gravitational effects are so large, they're so intense, okay, that nothing can escape that gravitational pull, those gravitational effects, okay? Not even light, and light doesn't even have a mass, okay? Nothing can travel faster than light. So if light cannot escape, nothing can escape from a black hole, okay? And it's useful to think of black holes as something that has like a boundary. Once you enter that boundary, that's where you cannot come out. So black holes aren't really vacuum cleaners uh, in the way that I imagined them when I was a kid. No, I used to imagine them as vacuum cleaners that would just suck up everything. They're not really like that. It's, it's more like if you enter uh, their event horizon, if you cross that boundary and you come in, then you cannot go out. So uh, in a sense, for the older students and the parents and the people that have amazing taste in music, uh, the black holes are like the Hotel California of the universe. That's how I like to think about them. Once you're in, you can't get out. 
Okay, that is what black holes are. So they're not sinks. The word hole makes us think that maybe they're like an actual hole in the space and time. They're not. Uh, they're not sinks. They're actually just regions. Think of them more like a sphere, okay, with an invisible boundary. And if you come in, you cannot really get out. That's what they are. So don't be that scared about them. They're far away enough so that we don't have to worry about them. Okay. Uh, black holes are actually very cool because they were a prediction of a theory. The theory of general relativity predicted their existence and then we detected them. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't that we, we saw something that we couldn't explain and then we tried to come up with an explanation. They were actually something that was predicted by a theory. So this is one of one of the great successes, if you will, uh, of general relativity. And this is something that is very exciting for people that do physics when you predict something and then through an experiment, you can actually prove that, yes, indeed, you were kind of right with your theory, right? And this theory of general relativity, what it tells us um, is that we need to interpret gravity as geometry, okay? That we experience gravity because the space time is getting deformed, okay? So for those of you who are in high school, you've probably heard about vectors, no? And you think of gravity as forces and vectors and so on. Uh, in this new perspective, what you need to think about is that objects that are heavy actually curve space time OK, and that is what tells you how objects are going to move in the presence of other uh, objects. Right. So black holes really deform space and time. OK, and that's why you see not only weird effects in space, such as things not being able to escape, but also you can see really weird things with time. No, like, for example, if you if you throw a person that you dislike into a black hole, actually you're going to perceive time differently. You're going to see that person falling in slow motion into the black hole. And that person is going to see as if you were going like faster and faster and faster. So time also does weird things uh, around black holes because of this idea uh, of, of space time getting curved. It's very weird, but very fun. Um, if you've seen like these memes that say, oh yeah, it, an hour in this planet is seven minutes on Earth. This is where I'm going to, I don't know, do my homework or whatever. Uh, those memes actually are rooted in reality because near black holes, actually time behaves differently. OK, so the idea is that we were black hole detectives, black hole hunters. And what are we going to do? as detectives for black holes. Well, if you're going to be a detective, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to spy on the neighbors, <laughs> on the people that you want to, to that you want to spy, right? If you want to know where they are, you're going to spy on the neighbors. So that's what we did as mankind. We wanted to know where the black holes were, and because they're black, they don't they they're not bright, no? If you see them in the, if you look up in the sky, they're not like stars. Stars are bright. They emit light. Uh, and that's how we know where they are. But black holes are black. Like, how are you going to how are you going to find them? Right. So what we did was spy on their neighbors because think of the following. We said that black holes had a very, very intense gravitational field. That means that they have very intense gravitational effects. No. In the same way that the Earth attracts the moon and the moon rotates around the Earth, no, that's a gravitational effect. In the same way that the Earth rotates around the sun, okay, that's a gravitational effect. In the same way, there are stars that orbit black holes. There are stars that are actually doing a trajectory like this, no, like an elliptic trajectory about a black hole. Imagine for a moment that the sun was invisible. How, how could we know that the sun is there if it's invisible? Well, if we see the planets rotating around something, even if it's invisible, we're going to be able to see, OK, there's probably something there. Maybe it's just that I cannot see it, right? But I can even calculate how heavy it is and how big it is and all of that. No, just doing some math. 
And that's exactly what we did to find black holes. We followed stars, okay? So I'm going to show you a little video in which you're going to see a star that is called uh, S2. It is a star that describes an orbit, no, an elliptic shape. Every 16 years, it does an orbit, it does a full turn. So these type of for these type of experiments, you have to be very patient, no? <laughs> because this this experiment, this video and this experiment has been going on for longer than some of you have been alive. Um, but they put some some telescopes in Chile and they tried to follow this star. So let me show you the video. And now it's, it's going to make a zoom so it's easier to see. But I want you to observe how it actually does make an elliptic curve. Okay, here comes the zoom. So you see the star. It's making its elliptic curve. And you see that it's very clearly orbiting something that it's kind of invisible, right? It's something that we cannot see because it does not emit light. But clearly, something has to be there, right? It's like when you're dancing with a person and that person is helping you make turns, right? Even if that person is invisible, we know that somebody is making you do the turns, right? Uh, so it's the same this way. The black hole is invisible, but the black hole is what it's driving this elliptic trajectory of this star. And this is something that we see over time, okay? So I don't know if you had a chance to see, but this experiment started in like 92, and the video ended in 2007, almost. So in 92, I was probably in the second grade, so probably the age of some of you. Um, and, and, the, and the video finished when I was in college. So, <laughs> so you have to be uh, kind of patient, right? Um, very good. But it's, it's a lot of fun. And where did we take this 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 video? Well, the the black hole that is being orbited is called Sagittarius A star, and it's actually the black hole that is in the center of our galaxy, in the center of the Milky Way. So it's pretty cool. We have evidence that in the center of our galaxy, there's actually a supermassive black hole. Okay, so. I don't know if some people are actually raising their hands to ask questions or just to say hi. <laughs> they probably have a lot of questions, but we're going to wait till the end of your okay. presentation. All right. It's OK. Go All right, ahead. I can hold them then. <laughs> OK, the second thing that we did in order to spy these black holes is that we try to listen to them interact with each other. So I don't know if you knew, but black holes can actually merge with each other, okay? Black holes don't really collide like this. What they do is they start to orbit each other like this until they merge, okay, until they combine. So they become a bigger black hole. And when that happens, okay, when that happens, uh, they, they create some waves that we called gravitational waves, okay? Waves like when you throw a stone in the river and you have like waves. Okay, these waves are also created when black holes combine, when they merge, okay? And so we created a, an experiment to detect that, okay? So let me show you more or less how black holes merge, uh, just so that you have like a, like a general idea. Now, if you have these two black holes, as I said, they're not going to merge directly like this. They're going to start orbiting each other, chuk, 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 until they merge and they become a bigger black hole. And then they're going to emit these waves. Now they're going to create these waves that are going to propagate through space time. And sometimes they can arrive to the Earth and we can detect them. How do we do that? We do that through a gravitational wave detector. We have one that is called LIGO, okay? And this LIGO, it's a gigantic building that has the shape of an L, okay? And not only we have one, we have two of them, okay? This is what we call an interferometer. Now, what's the idea of this thing? Basically, what it does is it can detect very, very tiny changes, okay? Very, very, very tiny changes. 
Okay, and we have two of them in two different cities in the United States. One is in Louisiana and the other one is in Washington. Okay, and the reason why we have two is so that we can make sure that we have actually measured gravitational waves. Because otherwise, it, it could be something else that is making the structure vibrate. No, um, these, of course, these are like very stable buildings, uh, but you always want to make sure that you have actually two detectors to make sure that it's actually gravitational waves, okay? But this, uh, these detectors, these gravitational wave detectors are so sensitive that they can measure changes in size, perturbations, okay? That have the size of 1,000th part of a proton, okay? So for those of you who are older that knows that, that atoms are made out of electrons, neutrons, and protons, and that they are very, very tiny and quite invisible for us, imagine a proton divided, divided in a thousand pieces, okay? So one of those little pieces, that's the size um, of the perturbations that can be detected through these objects, okay? Uh, and this was actually something that was very difficult for us to build. Uh, as mankind, it was a project that took a couple of decades uh, to finish. And in 2015, we were for the first time able to detect these gravitational waves. So I really want you to see the face of these people that when they made the announcement, because it really looks like a child that just did something that they shouldn't have. Um, it's like a mischievous uh, achievement. So I enjoy it very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. And the cool thing is they actually got a Nobel Prize uh, for, for this. Um, so, oh, if you don't know this person over here, this guy um, on, the, on the far right, that's Kip Thorne, he's a physicist and uh, he was the scientific advisor for the interstellar movie. So uh, he was actually one of the ones that got the, the uh, Nobel Prize for the detection of, of gravitational waves. So pretty cool stuff, okay? And now we can show that black holes actually collide, okay? So I wanna, I wanna play something for you, okay? Actually, what these detectors measure, okay, is uh, it's a signal, okay, uh, that has that has to do with uh, how these waves arrive uh, and how we process them and so on and so forth. And certain signals mean that we have had collision of black holes, okay. And some of these signals actually we can transform them to sound and we can hear them. Okay, so this is not the sound that the black holes made when they merged, but it's the sound of the signal that we get that means oh, two black holes collided. Okay, and I want to play it for you because it's something really special. Okay, uh, it's, it's not easy to listen to. You really have to know what you're looking for. So in the background, there's a lot of noise like shh. And then you're going to hear a tiny thing that says something like whoop or it's like a whip, okay? Uh, and that whip is an alarm for us. That means that two black holes have merged. And I want to give you some context. These waves traveled through all of the space time. They travel across the universe for many, many years to arrive to the earth, okay? So that means that this collision actually happened a long, long time ago, okay? This collision actually occurred 1.3 billion years ago. So this collision actually happened uh, when when life on Earth was in diapers, right? <laughs> we were we were starting to have like pluricellulars uh, at at the beginning, right? Uh, this was a really really long time ago, okay? And these were like two gigantic black holes. So the diameter was 150 kilometers for each. It's really like a truly gigantic. Uh, thing, okay? In these black holes, one was, uh, tw the mass was 29 times our sun, and the other one was 36 times the sun. So imagine that, okay? We're going to hear this alarm, this alarm that is telling us 
two gigantic black holes that are super massive, super heavy, uh, that collided before humans even existed. Uh, that's the alarm that I'm going to play for you. OK. So let's hear it. OK, did you get did you get to hear it? It was like a whip. OK, that is really the universe telling us what's happening. OK. I like this sound a lot because in a sense we are using nature to understand what is happening with nature, right? Uh, and it's a way in which we can understand phenomena that happen before mankind set foot on Earth, right? And, and it's, it's pretty special, it's pretty magical um, to be able to understand the universe like that. Uh, and this is something that we have done through large collaborations uh, as, as human beings. So I would say we're some really cool detectives, okay? Uh, and notice that there's two signals, no? One for each of the detectors, no? So one is in uh, in Livingstone, Louisiana, and the other one is in Harnford, uh, Washington. And if we hear the whip at the same time, that means that indeed this is what happened, no? Now, some of the uh, some of the older audience may say, hey, uh, I think you're lying to us because you said that you had a black hole of 29 solar masses and another one of 36 solar masses. And you said that they formed a gigantic black hole of 62 solar masses, but 29 and 36 doesn't add up to 62. You're lying, right? Um, and I'm not. It's just that the rest of those solar masses are actually uh, becoming energy. They're emitted as energy and they travel as waves. Remember that Einstein told us that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. So actually some of that mass just became energy and traveled in the form of waves, which is pretty cool. Okay, so detective moment number three, we haven't taken pictures of black holes, right? Uh, so that's what we did. We actually took a picture of a black hole and technically not the black hole, but the shadow of the black hole, because remember that black holes are black. No, uh, we, we can't really see them, but they can cast a shadow on things, okay? So that's, that's exactly what we're going to do. No, around black holes, there's always like bright disks, for example, no? Because they're, they're eating matter, no? They're eating particles and so on. And these particles, they form what we call an accretion disk. No, they, they just start turning around in a very accelerated way, going very fast, becoming very hot, uh, and hot things get bright, right? So around black holes, you always have like these bright disks, okay? And the black hole actually casts a shadow on that bright disk, okay? And, and it's a weird shadow. It tends to be bigger than the size of the black hole, because of how the space and time gets gets distorted near them. Um, so in any case, we said, OK, we're going to take a picture of a black hole. Which black hole? Well, you need to choose black holes that are big, right? And preferably black holes that are close to us, OK? So a good candidate for us was the black hole that was in the center of our galaxy, the one that I mentioned before. It's Sagittarius A star. Uh, and, and we chose that one and we choose another one. We also chose another one that is called M87 star. That one is further away, but it's also bigger. OK, so that kind of com compensates everything. OK, and then we said, OK, so we need to take a picture of this shadow of this black hole. So how are we going to do it? OK, how do we take pictures of things that are out there in the cosmos, right? Well, basically, we use telescopes, right? Uh, and the further away things are and the smaller they appear on the sky, uh, we need a more powerful telescope, right? So in order to take the picture of this black hole that is very far away from us, we would need a telescope that is powerful enough, just for reference, powerful enough to take a photograph of a DVD on the surface of the moon. That is the equivalent. OK, so just to give you a general idea on how powerful it has to be, right? 
something that would be able to take the picture of a DVD on the surface of the moon, okay? So we need this gigantic telescope, okay? Um, so you just make a big telescope, right? <laughs> the more powerful you need it, the bigger you build it, right? Uh, so people just did the math, the scientists did the math and say, okay, how big do we need to build our telescope? Um, and they figured out that they actually needed to build a telescope the size of the Earth. So, <laughs> so clearly we couldn't really do that. Um, and the idea that I came up with was this project that is called the Event Horizon Telescope. Okay, and what we when they, what they said is we can't really build a telescope the size of the Earth, but we have a lot of telescopes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of work with them as an array. Okay, we're going to coordinate them. We're going to have them uh, point in the same direction to try to take the picture and get like little pieces of the picture together. And then later we'll figure out how, they pe how we piece them together, right? <laughs> um, so there were multiple telescopes that participated, okay? For example, this one is in the South Pole, okay? This array is in Chile, it's called ALMA. Uh, no, and there were multiple ones. No, you can see that some of them were in Hawaii, Okay, there were telescopes in Europe, telescopes in the US, a telescope in Greenland. And you can see this one that I'm very proud of. There's a telescope in Mexico, actually, that uh, participated in that project as well. It's called the Large Millimeter Telescope, or in Spanish, we call it Gran Telescopio Milimétrico. Pretty cool. Um, and so what they did was they all pointed all of these telescopes at the same time to the black hole for multiple days. It was like for five days straight to get all of the information possible to try to reconstruct the picture, you now the image of the shadow of the black hole, okay? So these were some of the telescopes that participated and more and more, uh, more telescopes are joining the project, okay? So this is the one that is in Mexico. It's located at the top of a mountain. OK, uh, and this image was of the day that they actually uh, took some of the data uh, in in Mexico, in a city that is called Puebla. Um, so these are all of the all of the Mexican scientists. And you can see this lovely lady over here. If you if you're around the Internet a lot, maybe you will recognize her. Katie Bowman who was one of the most uh, visible people uh, in, in, in this project she visited from from the US. Um, okay, so once you have all of this information, now you have to build the picture, right? And imagine it was a lot of information, like a lot, a lot, a lot of information. So how are you going to gather that information and put it together? Imagine it was so much that you couldn't even put it through the internet, okay? You couldn't even send it through the internet. It was faster to get the hard drives from the South Pole through ship and actually put them on a ship as cargo and take them by ship to the continent than actually trying to send it over the internet. It was like a, a, an, absurd, an absurd amount of, of information, no? And then you have to build an image out of that information. And there are multiple techniques to rebuild images from partial information. Um, so then you have to choose which is the right technique to do it, which is the one that is going to give you the correct image. So what they did is they built different teams of scientists in different parts of the world, okay? You can see them as the yellow points in this map, okay? This, were, this was where we had groups of scientists trying to rebuild this image, okay? So there were scientists in Mexico, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, in Asia, everywhere, okay? Uh, and then they said, okay, we're going to work on this. We're going to build this image. Don't talk to each other. And if we all get the same image, that means that it's that it's right, that it's a good image, right? That this is what the, what the shadow of the black hole actually looks like. Um, it took them two years to actually process all of the data and come up with an image. Uh, but two years later, this is what we had. So let me show you how 
reality surpasses fiction. So this was one of the announcements that was made. OK. Um, and what I love about this announcement. Is that this person said we have seen what we thought was invisible. We have seen and taken a picture of a black hole. So this is what the black hole looks like. OK, this is the image of the black hole. Now, this is very special because I got obsessed with black holes when I was nine and the Internet wasn't even a thing. And I uh, I had to make good with just images and paintings of what artists thought black holes would look like. Um, I've devoted all of my adult life to try to understand black holes, and I never imagined that I would one day see a picture. So <laughs> this is pretty amazing. We've seen a picture of a black hole. We've heard that two black holes collide. We've seen artistic representations of black holes that come from equations. I'm a person that feels very grateful to be able to live in this time for physics because we're seeing one exciting discovery after another. And this comes from the fact that humans really want to know about black holes. So we have been some amazing detectives uh, for black holes. So let me introduce you to this guy over here. This black hole is called M87 star. OK, he's in the center of the Messier galaxy. OK, it's a massive galaxy that is around the Virgo cluster and it's really far away, very far away. And it's also very massive, very heavy. OK, it has 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. So it's a super massive black hole just so that you can get an idea of of the size of the shadow of this black hole. So this is a solar system, right? This is the sun and this is Pluto, who is no longer a planet. OK, and this is where the Voyager one is. I don't know if you've heard about the Voyager one, probably the Voyager one, probably the parents have. Uh, so this is the man made object that is that has reached the further out from our planet. OK, this this was a, a, a spaceship, a rocket, a spaceship that was built uh, quite a few decades ago, okay, and we launched it, and it just keeps going and going and going further and further away from Earth, okay? And it's, it's our object that has been made on the Earth that has reached the furthest away uh, from the Earth. So just so that you have like a sense of scale, right? Uh, so of course that day I was I was particularly happy uh, and I'm going to share you why I'm so happy about this experiment. This is my favorite experiment in all of science and in all of physics, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, probably your parents, in a similar way than me, grew up in, in a time in which science was competitive because it was used for warfare. Um, and they even experience the the space race, you know, the race to get to the moon and so on. Uh, but it was a race that was very politically charged and it really represented animosity uh, behind two countries, right? It, it represented uh, how much really they hated each other and wanted to beat each other. Uh, this experiment, uh, the, the image of this black hole, no country can do it alone. You actually need telescopes all over the world to be able to get the image and, and reproduce it and so on. So it's an experiment that you cannot do alone. Um, and for me, this is a beautiful example of, of cooperation. Uh, and for me, this image represents the new era of science that you guys get to grow up in. Uh, the world in which you will grow up is a world in which science is collaborative. It's a, it's a world in which science is done by communities. And, and I'm very happy that this is the world that you're going to get to grow up and to grow up in. Yeah. So beautiful experiment. We got a picture of a black hole. Uh, and now this one is a work in progress. Uh, we will actually want to record a video of a black hole. But yeah, that's a, a big, big work in progress. 
Um, so we haven't done that yet. Um, so yeah, let's keep being black hole detectives. Now, very, very briefly, I'm going to tell you how I became a black hole detective. And this is this part is going to be fast. Um, so people tend to imagine that in order to be a scientist, you need to be some sort of like child genius. Uh, and you need to be doing like partial differential equations when you're seven. Uh, and that's not really what happens. Uh, usually this is what happens. Uh, you're just a child that is curious and likes to play and enjoys nature. And over time, you start asking yourself questions and you start learning how nature actually connects to, to math, to, to physics. You, you try to understand the, the models and the phenomena and so on. But it really just starts with curiosity and being a child that plays around. Uh, and then, of course, you go to college and you learn more things, no? You learn how to think in math, uh, you learn how to do experiments, you learn languages, uh, and that includes programming languages as well. You have to go out, you have to meet people, you have to take classes that can be very small or, or very big. But the most important part is that you, you change the way in which you think, uh, because you have to think in a very structured way, but also in a very creative way. And we tend to think that those two things are separate, but they're not really that separated, no? Uh, and you learn how to do that, basically taking math classes, working in the lab, learning how to program. Uh, and then you need to learn how to express yourself, either writing or speaking, no? Uh, and you need to be able to communicate at different levels, no? So first of all, you need to start learning how to communicate with yourself, <laughs> keeping good notes, uh, keeping track of all the experiments that you do and so on. Then learning how to talk to those of you, to those uh, that are in your field, but also with everyone else, no? Not necessarily every single person is going to be a physicist and you really want to talk physics with everyone. Um, when I was in college, I was part of the student council and I got to organize multiple seminars. And I would recommend you older students to do that too. If you have the opportunity to participate in helping uh, creating these seminars or these talks, uh, it's actually something great for your growth, okay? It will help you uh, build relationships with your peers. And these peers are going to become your peers as adults. And they're the people that are going to tell you, uh, hey, there's a job opening uh, where I work or things like that. That's called networking. They're going to tell you about uh, potential opportunities. OK, uh, and you're going to get to know the speakers, but also the speakers are going to get to know you. Um, and you can get to know like things that you may be interested in, in the future that you didn't even know existed. OK, and this was my case, and this is why I'm, I'm so happy and so proud that your school organizes all of these things, um, because this is how you're going to get to know things that you may or may not potentially like. So this is what happened to me. I went to a talk on black hole thermodynamics in 2008, and I said, this is what I want to do. Uh, I, I never knew that black holes and thermodynamics could mix. Um, and then a few years later, I completed my PhD on that field. And almost a decade, well, a little bit over a decade later of, of that first hearing about black hole thermodynamics, uh, I was considered an expert in black hole thermodynamics. And now I was the people, I was the person that was doing the talks and teaching the younger generations, right? So that's how you're going to get to know things by being exposed to them. And the more you can have international experiences, the better. I did a part of, of my physics degree in France. Uh, I, it was a great opportunity through an exchange program. Uh, and it was amazing. I got to see a synchrotron, a particle accelerator for the first time, uh, the Cherenkov effect. It, it was something that was really cool. Uh, and it's a very big growth experience. And as you grow, you get to have international friends that eventually with time will become international collaborators and international colleagues for you in your work. So if you're interested in science, start getting involved and that will just continue, okay? It will continue, continue, continue. Even if it's little things, just approach the people that do it and, and ask how you can get involved in that 
my, my path was a little bit weird because I started working in things with optics and then and then I continued into into the field of black holes that that I really enjoyed um, and that has taken me to to many places. So this is from a seminar that that I gave in Chile. Um, so in summary, becoming a physicist actually has allowed me to see the universe in a very different way uh, to try to understand it in a way that I that I think is very profound and that it amazes me every single day. It's really a beautiful, beautiful thing. But also in a more mundane uh, aspect, being a scientist has also allowed me to see the world. Uh, it, it is a path of life that has taken me to many places to, to share my ideas on, on black holes and also to learn from others. Uh, so it's been, it's been an amazing opportunity. Um, and also, fortunately for me, combining my two passions, which are science and education, has allowed me to go through life in a path in which I have never faced uh, unemployment. So I'm also very, very grateful for that uh, because I, I, I get to do what I love for a living. OK, and also, I mean, science is giving me great, great friends for the rest of my life. And most importantly, while I was doing my PhD, I got to meet I got to meet my amazing husband, who is also a physicist. So so yeah, I all of the beautiful things in my life I think I owe to science. So I'm I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share this with you today. And this is what I wish for you. Uh, that whatever whatever it is that you love, every day you get to do what you love. So this is my personal email, my work email. This is the one that I check more often, the work one. Uh, and also you can find me on Facebook as the Black Hole Detective. Um, so this is what I wanted to share with you today. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, I think. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Juarez. Thank you for sharing all this captivating information on how to capture black holes, about how we can actually hear them and as well how to become a black hole paparazzi. I must say that all your insights, all the expertise that you have shared with us is truly fascinating. And I think all of our students are amazed with what they've learned today. So I really thank you from the science area and our school, which is Jenny Digital School. And well, I think that we have a lot of students with their hands yes. raised. And I know That's that you have a part. lot of wonderful questions about your talk and about you. So, okay, guys, <laughs> this is the perfect time so you can ask questions to Dr. Juarez. I know that she is really, really excited to answer almost all of them or some of them at least. And well, even though this talk was in English, Dr. Juarez is also a Spanish speaker, so feel free to ask in either Spanish or English if you feel more comfortable with any of those languages. So let's see who we have over here. And I'm going to choose randomly, guys, so you can ask away. And the first one, Franco Manuel, go ahead, please. Can we add him in spotlight? And hi. You hear me? Hi, Franco. Yes, we can hear you. OK. I have many questions, but we I will ask a little bit of all. Well, not all, but some questions I have. The first, what do you know of of ton? Of ton. Uh, do you know the biggest black hole in all the universe? What do you know of that? OK, so black holes actually come in many sizes, OK? And the biggest, biggest, biggest ones, uh, we think that were formed actually at the beginning of the universe. Supermassive black holes, actually, we think that are primordial black holes. They, they were formed at the beginning. Uh, and also, really supermassive, really big black holes have a very important role in the universe because they have a lot of gravity, okay? And they actually help um, keep the structure, in a sense, of the universe, no? Because they're, they're really large 
poles of gravitational attraction, right? So the universe as we know it has the shape that it has and has the structure that it has in a big part thanks to supermassive black holes. They play a very important role, right? As opposed okay. to, for example, stellar black holes that are the ones that get formed when stars die that are not as massive and not as big, no? And then in the middle, you have others that are called intermediate black holes that we're not really sure how they were formed, but we know that they weren't formed out of the dead of stars. So we think that those were made out of mergers uh, of black holes. So definitely a very important role uh, that they play in the universe. And especially okay. the big ones, right? Like you mentioned. Another uh, question that I think very... Uh, very much uh, kids they have that mm -hmm. is what happens if a black hole eat you? What happens? Oh, that's a great question. I love it. Okay, so <laughs> so first, as you start getting closer to the black hole, so imagine that this is the black hole, right? And you're going to fall into the black hole. Okay, what happens is that the gravitational pull here is actually very big and it's bigger than, for example, here, no? When you're a bit further away from the black hole, right? Okay. So imagine that you are the person that is falling into the black hole like this. Your okay. feet, let's imagine that these are your feet. <laughs> your feet actually experience more pull than your head, for instance, no? And so what's going to happen is your feet experience more pull than your head. So something like this. <laughs> now, I'm not the bio specialist, but I think that break happens around here. <laughs> okay. um, and then the pieces that that remain of you actually experience the same. No, so clack uh, again. And all of the pieces do that until you are like a string of particles. Um, and that is called death by spaghettification. And that is the actual scientific name of it. Um, okay. and, and then there's also like the weird thing that happens with time uh, in which you're going to, to see time go. If you're looking at people that are far away from the black hole, you're going to think that their time is going by faster than yours. And from their perspective, your time is going slower. Um, so, yeah. If you're interested in that sort of thing, because this is like a short explanation, there's a book by Neil deGrasse Tyson that is called Death by Black Hole. And I think you would love it. And also your I English is great. I love it. <laughs> final question, so no waste the other questions. To so no waste the time of the others. The final. Thank you, Franco. Uh, we can destroy a black hole. Oh, that's a good one. Actually, black holes die by themselves. Oh. Um, yes, there's. it's a process. I didn't really mention it because it, it's a quantum mechanical process. Uh, but there is a process in which black holes, we say that they evaporate. What happens is they radiate their mass away. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about Stephen Hawking. Yeah, uh, he I was know. a famous scientist and he discovered some... I... He discovered something that is called the Hawking radiation, which is oh. the process through which black holes actually radiate their matter away. OK, so they, they radiate and they become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. If they're very big, they actually do this very slowly. No, but the, as they become smaller, when they're small, they actually radiate their mass away very fast, like uh, and they die very fast when they're very, very small. So the ones that are big that are out there in the universe, we don't have to worry about them. They're going to be alive for a very long time. But if even if we were able to create tiny black holes here on Earth, they wouldn't survive long enough for them to get big or anything. So we don't have to worry about that. And we don't have to worry about destroying black holes. They will all eventually die themselves. This type of science is insane. I love it. It is insane, isn't it? I love it. <laughs> thank you for thank you for thank all, you for your thank questions. You for, for, for information. For, thank you. Thank you, Franco, for asking. Those were wonderful questions. 
they were. So now let's go with someone else. And we have as well Samantha Rivas. So she can ask away. Hey, Sam. You can do it. Go ahead. Um, well, um, I'm Samantha, I'm from Bogota, and I don't know if you can answer all the questions that I have, but I have three in special. So, how many types of black holes they are? Okay, it depends on how you separate them. For example, by size, mm -hmm. you have stellar black holes, intermediate black holes, supermassive black holes, no? which are the ones that I mentioned. But you can also separate them by the qualities that they have. For example, if a black hole doesn't have electric charge and it's not spinning, we call it a Schwarzschild black hole, Schwarzschild black hole. If it only has a elect, uh, if it has, a, if it's only spinning, we call it a care black hole. If it's spinning and it has electric charge, we call it a care Newman uh, black hole. And if it only has charge, the name is escaping me right now, but I'm, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to remember it in a moment. <laughs> uh, but it also has a, it also has a name if it only has charge, but it's not spinning. So that's also another classification for black holes. OK, so my my second question is they can be ubiquitous in any part of the universe or in one in special. Okay, so supermassive black holes are usually in the center of each galaxy, okay? Uh, on the other hand, stellar black holes are actually formed when certain stars die. And these stars need to have at least some minimum amount of mass. For example, our sun, when it dies, it will not become a black hole. But other more massive stars can become black holes when they die, okay? And in that sense, wherever you have that sort of stars, you can eventually have uh, a stellar black hole. But the supermassive ones, those are in the centers of the galaxies. OK, and my last question, how massive black holes they are created? OK, that's a great question. And again, it depends on the size, no? So, for example, uh, the black hole that that we photographed, okay, the black hole that we photographed that was called M87 star, that thing is huge and it's like very, very massive. 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun, okay? And if you compare it with the one in the center of our galaxy, like now. the difference is it's, it's, very big, Unless like you can say like th a thousand times or something like that. They can actually vary a lot. And the ones that are formed from stars, uh, they can actually have like the same mass that the star had. So you can have like differences in billions. Uh, it's, it's actually very, very different depending on the type of black hole that you have. I got like frozen. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. So yeah, what it's I because said, it's my it's because it's my first time asking questions. Don't worry. And... Don't worry, I'll repeat it. Uh, so what I said is that you can have black holes that don't have a lot of mass, no, because they came from a star, and they keep the mass of the star. That's their mass, right? Or you can have other black holes that are very massive, like the one that we took a picture of. That thing is like 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. So really the uh, the interval of masses that you can have is gigantic. Oh, well, I love astronomy and thank you so much. I love it too and you're great and your English is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Samantha. Fascinating questions as well. Then we have, well, I see that we have a lot of questions. And next one that we choose, Laura Siqueira. Go ahead and ask away. Hi. Hi. Hi, uh, hi Carla. My name is Laura. I, I'm from Brazil and I live here. And I have one question. The, 
a long question only. It's not about black holes, but it's about astronomy, and I like to ask him. Okay, I'll uh, try my best. <laughs> you can talk about warm hole, warmy holes, and warm. time travel. Okay, warm holes and what? Sorry. Time travel. In time travel, that's a great question, actually. So wormholes are something that, in principle, the theory of general relativity allows, right? Uh, and and you and you can have a, a structure in which you have like a, a wormhole that connects here, no? And it has like a throat through which everything goes, right? The problem is that when you start doing the math, the size of this throat is actually not big enough for for objects, people, or whatever to go through. And then the other thing is, in order for you to, uh, the throat is unstable, that's the problem, okay? So the, the tunnel, if you will, is unstable. And for you to be able to keep this tunnel open, to actually be able to go from here to here, no, from point A to point B through the throat, uh, the problem is that you would need to put like like exotic matter through it, no, and use like dark energy or, or black matter or antimatter or, or weird things like to keep the throat open to actually be able to, to go through. So the theory at the moment allows for the existence of wormholes. The problem is that they're not stable, no? And you you wouldn't be really able to theoretically use them to to go from point A to point B either in space or in time, because remember that space-time is the same thing, no? Um, so that's what I can tell you about wormholes. I'm not a specialist in wormholes, though. So, <laughs> so this is just like my basic knowledge on the topic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank that was you, a Lara. great question. And your English was also very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Why are you feeding these kids? They're so smart. With a lot of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura. Good job. Now let's go with Abril Renteria. Okay. And I'm going to have to wrap up after this one. Sure. Because unfortunately, I have a meeting. This is a it's lot more okay, fun, doctor. though. <laughs> go ahead. And my question is, I have two questions. The first is, can you live inside of a black hole or they, uh, as a life, a life being can live inside a black hole or mm -hmm. they, or a black, or the, or the black hole will destroy them instantly? Unfortunately, I don't think you can you can live inside of a black hole. You will probably be destroyed with this yeah. spaghettification process. Yeah, bad news because and, I would love to vacation there. And second, is is this cartel? Like second is to the trash. Like if you can't live inside a black hole, you can't talk about how we sleep inside the black hole. Yes. I'm not really sure I understood that one. Probably yes. that was my internet. Uh, Professor Jasmine, did, did you hear the question? Because I don't think I heard it properly. If you could live in black hole, right, Avril? What? You asked that if we could live in black hole? Yes. No, Many. I ask, and um, second question I ask, how we sleep inside a black hole? How we like, can sleep? Yes. Oh, sleep, sleep inside of a black hole? Well, that one is a little bit more complex. Live. Live. Yes, live. How sleep ah, inside of a okay. black hole? How can we leave? How, how can we leave, like get out of a black hole? Now live inside of the black. Live inside. We live cannot, inside. unfortunately. It is not possible. As far as we know, it's not possible. But who knows? Maybe you'll figure out a way. Yes, possible that the persons stay inside the black hole and stay and stay and stay and then die. Actually, oh. what 
what happens is once you're inside the black hole, so you've crossed the event horizon, you're going to, to travel to the center, which is where the singularity is, okay? But by or that maybe, moment, you're yes. not going to be alive anymore. Or maybe you this make you pass time, pass the time, and then you are part of the black hole. Yes. Exactly. Then you are part of the black hole. That's what happens. Then you are part of the black hole. Very good. Yes. And this is my first bit in life of in English. That is very you impressive. Think, right? I in life that I go is in Spanish, 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 <laughs> Spanish, Spanish. Well, you did really well for your first one in English. I'm very yes. proud. Yes. Thank you very much, Avril, for your question and for participating as well. So okay. thank you guys for raising the hands. I know that we cannot or we don't have enough time, so you can ask me, uh, Dr. Juarez. But guess what? You can write to her in her email and ask any questions that you have. So, well, now that we need to wrap up this Wonderful being live. I want to thank you, Dr. Juarez, for participating, for being our guest speaker. This was so much I think fun. that your experience and expertise have enriched us with a lot of knowledge, a lot of amazing information about black holes and about you and your life and your passion about science and physics. I know that a lot of us have a lot of passions related to physics and sciences in overall. So thank you very much. And well, I also want to thank you guys because without your incredible questions, it would not be the same. So thank you for your curiosity and the engagement in this uh, beating life. It was a success for all of us. It was incredible to have you here, Dr. Juarez, and to have you here, guys. And a special thanks to our audience as well in our social media platforms. It's great that we have you as well as our extended audience. And well, that will be all. Thank you all for being part of this Science Beating Life. Thank you for all these experiences that we shared. And well, we look forward to continue sharing this passion towards science together. So thank you very much, Dr. Juarez. Thank you. Goodbye. And I, I love Goodbye. this. I wish I could say. Bye. Goodbye, Dr. Juarez. Have a nice day. Have a lovely day. Bye. Thank you for all the answers. Bye. Bye bye. And thank, guys, thank you, so much. Thank, you the thank you all of you. So something important that I want to mention is that you are going to be able, the well, middle schoolers and high schoolers to access to the next class. So next class is at 1230. So we can have the next session. But thank you very much for all of you for attending, for participating, for the ones that asked questions. Those questions were fascinating. Thank you very much. And for all those people that still have questions, you can write an email to Dr. Harris and write to me as well. So thank you very much and have a nice day, guys. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye, Samantha. Bye, guys.